and welcome to Misconceptions, a program that is committed to rightly dividing the word of truth. I'm your host, Romul Gusain, and today we have with us Dr. Mark Harwood from Creation Ministries International, who will be discussing with us the origins of mankind. Welcome to the show, Doctor. Thank you for having me, Rommel. It's a real pleasure to have you come here and share some, some of your insights with us. Thank you. Now, what we would like to talk about today is the origins of man. Now, it's oftenly, uh, often sorry, believed that uh, you know, man descended from the apes, or they, they have a common ancestor with the apes. Is that true? Well, that's the commonly held view that our culture has today. And what that really reflects is a view or a belief in the evolutionary story of origins, how the universe made itself through unguided random processes and the millions and millions of years that we keep hearing about. But, you know, there's something we need to be aware of when we discuss the origin of man. And I think the most important thing to lay down first is to understand that there are two different sorts of sciences. Now, that might sound a bit odd, but I worked for many years in the satellite communications field, for instance, and I was involved in what you could call experimental or operational science. Mm -hmm. Now, that's the kind of science which gives you all of the amazing gadgets and inventions that we have today, like uh, mobile phones, computers, and all this sort of stuff that we just take for granted. Yes. Now, the point about experimental science is that it's based on observable, repeatable experiments. And in principle, anybody could do those things. But there's another kind of science we hear a lot about, and it's what we could call historical science. And historical science is when the scientist looks at evidence in the present and makes up a story about the past to explain what he's observing in the present. Now, when we do that, we, in fact, invoke our belief systems about the past. So there's basically two main branches, you would say, under science. One is experimental and the other one is... Historical, historical. that's right. Okay. It's a bit like a detective story in a way. You imagine the detectives at the scene of a crime looking at the evidence and they're trying to figure out what actually happened at the scene of the crime. So with the origins of, of man, where does that sit? Well, when we're talking about origins, we're talking about historical events, historical science, things that we did not actually observe. Now, when we don't observe something, we therefore can't be 100% sure what happened. You see, just like the scene of a crime, what we actually need is to have an eyewitness account, someone who was actually there at the scene of the crime, who saw it happen, and so on. Now, I believe we have an eyewitness account of our origins, and that eyewitness account is what we find in God's Word, the Bible, Bible yes. because God was obviously there, he created the universe, and uh, he doesn't lie to us, he knows everything, he would not deceive us, that would make no sense. And so we can have, can have complete confidence in what the Bible tells us. Sure, so that makes me ask, are there any proven examples? You know, are there any evolutionary links uh, you know, b between us and our common, supposedly, you know, ancestor, the apes? Well, there are many that are put forward, but I would suggest to you that none of them really stand scrutiny. And uh, let me give you some examples. One that's very commonly talked about is Lucy. And uh, Lucy is um, one of these creatures called uh, uh, an Australopithecus afarensis. And in fact, we have one up on the, the uh, set behind us that's here. That's right. Now, Lucy was found in 1974, and it was hailed as the missing link between the common ancestor between apes and humans and mankind. And that claim was made on the basis of a, uh, a bone found somewhat later, actually, uh, a toe bone, which, from which they concluded that it actually walked on two feet. That's it, just a toe bone? That, that was the claim, that's right. Okay. But subsequently, as they found more examples of Australopithecus afarensis, it turns out that, in fact, it uh, walked on all fours. And okay. it was, it's really not uh, considered now to be a valid um, candidate as a missing link between our claimed ancestor and, uh, and human beings. Is there, is there any other examples? Um, there are a lot of others. We hear a lot about Neanderthals, for instance. Um, Neanderthals are uh, claimed to be uh, more recent links between our ancestors and, and uh, modern humans. But you know, they found in, um, and some, something like 500 different Neanderthal skeletons have been found, 
um, buried in such a way that illustrates religious rituals. Um, they had musical instruments. Um, so all the evidences, I suppose, that you would associate with these um, as being actual human beings, modern human beings. But more interestingly, there have been some recent DNA tests which have shown that there's a very high correlation to modern humans. And in fact, that they likely interbred with what we would call wow. modern humans. So in fact, all the evidences that you're showing us now, rather than um, you know, working against what the Bible says, they're actually in support of it when you dig down deeper that's into right. the evidence. If you use experimental science, right, and that's the distinction I want to make, and that is where you look at the data and um, be aware of the, uh, the world view or the mindset, the belief system, that you are using to interpret the data. So what we see is people who are trying to fit the evidence into their idea of the millions and millions of years of evolutionary progression all the way up to modern man. And so you've never found, like in all your research and all your investigative you know, um, analysis, whatever you would like to call it, every time you uh, something has been proposed when you look at it and you study it, you actually find out it's actually more evidence towards you know, the support of that. We've always existed the way we were from the beginning. Like man hasn't uh, yes. you know, changed really that much. That's right, that's right. The, 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 the claimed missing links turn out to be either extinct apes or they turn out to be human beings. And we have some uh, excellent materials that um, people might want to research further on this on our website creation.com. There are articles that look at each of these claimed ancestors. But one that you might be interested in here, this is a, a quotation from an anthropologist talking about Neanderthal man. Okay. And he said that if a Neanderthal could be reincarnated and placed in a New York subway, provided that he were bathed, shaved and dressed in modern clothing, it is doubtful whether he would attract any more attention than some of its other denizens meaning other travellers on the train. In other words, if you dressed up a Neanderthal in modern clothes like you and I are wearing, you'd just walk past him in the street. Can't you tell. wouldn't wouldn't identify them as being anything other than a human being. And we were talking about this previously, is that, you know, the artists, uh, their impressions, usually they, uh, you know, they, they try and invent or they come up with what they think um, you know, this skeleton actually looked like. You see that with the dinosaurs. I mean, no one really knows what these dinosaurs really looked like because they didn't live back then. Um, and I think you, you mentioned that they, the, the, the soft features of... The soft body parts are usually not preserved. What we have are the bones, the, the skeletal structures. Uh -huh. And from that, people try and build images of, of what these creatures, um, you know, might have looked like. But uh, just on that point, here's an interesting example called Boxgrove Man. And uh, here you see uh, an image of this from a newspaper. And the newspaper article says this, Europe's oldest known man lived 500,000 years ago. He ate elephant and was tall and robust, British archaeologists said yesterday. And uh, the interesting part about this is that the only piece of evidence they found was a single piece of shin bone. Now, wow. from that, they constructed the image there you see in the background um, of this guy with a sloping forehead and, you know, covered in hair and so on. But all they found was a piece of shin bone. And interestingly, that piece of shin bone looks just like a modern human shin bone. And that really doesn't have, it shows, it doesn't have anything to do with science. This is really, you're sort of creating or you're um, putting forward a theory or a hypothesis. That's right. It, it's, it's building evidence to support a belief system. That's yes, right, indeed. That's and people have become very uh, committed to this. In fact, to the point where there have actually been hoaxes um, which have been um, continued for many, many years. One was called Piltdown Man. And uh, he had a skull of a modern human, but the teeth of an orangutan which had been put together, the teeth were filed down to make them look aged. So this was deliberately done? It was done deliberately. It was found uh, in 1915 and published, but it was exposed as a forgery in 1953, 38 years later. Wow. And that was in textbooks and it was used as evidence. Another one as Nebraska man turned out to be based on a pig's tooth. That was all the evidence 
but it didn't stop people constructing elaborate images and pictures, which were really just reflections of imaginations. And imaginations, of course, reflect people's belief systems. And I would imagine these things, they would do a lot of damage, wouldn't they? I mean, well, if it's been out for 38 years... It becomes very, very yeah. entrenched in people's thinking and it uh, gets deeply embedded into textbooks. The problem is, you see, that it leaves the public mindset with the view that this is all proven, it's established. These missing links are, are well known. But when you dig into them, you discover, as I mentioned earlier, they're either extinct apes or they're, in fact, human beings. They're not, yes. And so is there also any uh, similarities between the DNA of a, of a human and these so-called uh, missing links? Well, one of the classic things that you often hear is that the DNA um, of a chimpanzee is 95% um, the same as the DNA of a human being. Uh, the number varies a little depending on what researchers um, conclude. It's been as high as 98 and as low as 92, but let's say 95 for argument's sake. And, uh, and so from that, people infer, therefore, human beings must be descendants of chimpanzees. Kind of makes sense when you think about it. Well, on it, face yeah. value, it seems like it's a good argument. Yes. But let's think about what the DNA actually does. You see, the DNA is a set of coded instructions that determines what the creature actually looks like. So, for instance, um, we have two arms, two legs, a head, um, eyes, nose, ears, and so on. But so, too, does a chimpanzee. So if you think about it from the, the broad features, the structural parts, um, there must be a lot of similarity. A lot of the internal organs, uh, they have hearts, lungs, so do we. Stomach, digestive system, so do we. So not surprisingly, there's a great deal of similarity in the DNA. But let's think about it another way. The human DNA has something like three billion letters, um, which you can be thought of like the letters in a book. Now, 5% of that is still 150 million letters. That's an awful lot of oh, letters. Yes. You could write a lot of books with 150 <laughs> million letters. And it's in that information that we find the profound differences between mankind and the apes. Okay. Things like our extraordinary language abilities and communication abilities, our abilities to, uh, to abstractly reason and so on. All the things that make a human being a human being and not just a chimpanzee. So similarities actually don't, um, well, it, it, in a sense, they're not surprising between chimpanzees and human beings, but the differences are very significant. But another point is that similarities can also reflect the fact that there was a common designer. Yes, that's right. Now, let me give you a bit of a trivial example. I mean, I don't know if you've ever driven a Porsche. Um, you, you might not earn that no, much. I I wish. <laughs> uh, you might have driven a VW, the old Beetle. Uh, I have. <laughs> and uh, they have a four cylinder, horizontally opposed air cooled engine. Uh, they have a snappy little gearbox. But interestingly, so too does a Porsche. Now, does that mean that the Porsche evolved from the VW? No way. Big well, difference. It, exactly. What it means is they had the same designer, Dr. Porsche. So not surprisingly, he used similar solutions to the same kind of problems that he encountered. So when we see similarities in organisms, it doesn't necessarily mean that they have common ancestors. It also means, and perhaps in fact I think is a better description, that they have a common designer. Yes. And here's an illustration of um, uh, three different types of creature. One is an ichthyosaur, which is a reptile. Another is a shark, which is a fish and a killer whale, which is a mammal. Now, all three of those creatures have very, very similar features. They look very much the same. They live in the same environment. They are designed for that. And so similar design solutions were used, but they're completely different. One is a mammal, one's a reptile. They can't have all simultaneously evolved from each other. So it doesn't imply ancestry at all. This similarity thing has also been used in a a rather fraudulent and um, uh, unpleasant way. Back in 1866, not long after Darwin published his book on the origin of species, a man called Ernst Haeckel published a set of drawings of the embryos of a number of different creatures. Yes. Um, you might have seen these in biology textbooks. Yes. 
And he had, for instance, the embryo of a fish, a salamander, a turtle, a rabbit, and so on. And one of them was a human being. And he was trying to show that they're all very similar or exact. That's right. Remember. Very, very similar. Yes. He showed His drawing showed great similarity between the embryos. And his argument was that this similarity at the embryonic stage shows that we all, all these different creatures, had a common ancestor. Now, interestingly, as technology has developed, people are now able to take actual photographs of embryos. And uh, a scientist did this in 1997, and he photographed these embryos. And you can see here in our uh, illustration that the actual photographs bear no relationship to Heichel's drawings. Wow. It was actually an outright fraud. But tragically, it took 131 years to, to expose discover. the fraud. Yes. And in that time, it became deeply embedded into the biology the textbooks. People, yes. That's right. And it was often upheld as, as uh, being proof that evolution has taken place. When you go from school to school and church to church, are you finding that there's more and more people that are resistant to the idea that there is a universal creator, a God, and he created all things? I do to a degree, yes, because there is, has been over the last uh, several decades a significant increase in the teaching of evolution in schools. And uh, in fact, nowadays, if you try and, as a teacher, if you didn't believe evolution, yes. um, you have a major problem because um, you are obliged pretty much by the state and by um, the government legislation to teach evolution and also to not criticise the evolutionary belief system. People who do stand up against it and point out its flaws um, often discover that they can be ostracised and, and so on. So there seems to be an increasing um, tempo, if you like, or a crescendo. Um, in fact, it's becoming almost um, uh, shrill in its, its emphasis that we evolved. And what, what it's really saying is there is no God. Wow, that's amazing. If you think about it, if we yeah. evolved over millions and millions of years by accident, there's no need for a God, is there? Mm, that's right. Now, so we've spent quite a fair bit of time trying to understand um, what it is that we're being taught, the things that are being perpetrated that are out there, and we've discovered that there are so many flaws, so many gaps, so many um, missing links, really. How about if we now go to the Bible? Yes. Tell us a little bit about yes. what the Bible says. What, where is the, you know, what is the origin of man, according well, the, to the Bible? The Bible makes it very, very clear. It says in Genesis chapter 1, verse 27, let me read it to you. So God created man in his own image. In the image of God, he created him, male and female, he created them. So the Bible makes it absolutely clear, right in the very first chapter, that God deliberately and purposefully created man. Most importantly, though, he created man in his image. Now, no other creature in the whole of the creation has the privilege and the honour of having been made in God's image, which means that we are not just highly developed animals, uh, which is what the evolutionary story says. Um, we are, in fact, purposefully created by a loving God. That's what the Bible tells us. Now, that's a very different story from that's what right. we are hearing in our culture and what we're being taught in our education system and so on. That's right. And so what does that lead us to? If it's true, uh, what, what is it that you would challenge our viewers with? Well, I would firstly challenge our viewers to be very um, thoughtful about information that is presented to them, to discern the difference between scientific observable evidence and belief systems about the past. That's the first thing I would say. And I would um, encourage people to have complete confidence in God's word. As we've discussed in previous sessions, there are many ways that we can show that God's word, the Bible, uh, is in fact totally trustworthy right from the very first verse. But we find the evidence in the world around us is overwhelmingly in support of what the Bible says. And I'd love to share a couple of things with you, if I may. Yeah, please do. For instance, um, in Genesis chapter 3, verse 20, it says this, Adam named his wife Eve because she would become the mother of all living. Now you'd think, yep, yeah, so. But do you know what? We have in the cells in our body some DNA called mitochondrial DNA. 
Now mitochondrial DNA, as it turns out, is passed to us from our mothers. So when we examine the structure of mitochondrial DNA, scientists, and I don't just mean people who believe in the Bible, but secular scientists, have concluded that all human beings living today came from one original woman wow. because of the links through mitochondrial DNA. Now, somewhat tongue-in-cheek, I expect they call her mitochondrial Eve, um, <laughs> but they don't think that this woman was the only woman, woman on the yes. face of the earth. Okay. But the data is entirely consistent with what the Bible says. So we can equally interpret it just as well as being consistent with what Adam said, that Eve would be the mother of all living. And that's exactly what we see. So the way the Bible tells the story is the, or, or its account of history, perhaps a better way of saying it, is there was originally Adam and Eve, uh, the first man and woman, who had many sons and daughters. And as the generations went on, more and more people came on the earth. We talked uh, previously about God's judgment, as great wickedness spread out across the world, and only Noah, his wife, their three sons, and their wives survived the flood. They then started to repopulate the earth, and then came the Tower of Babel. Now, the Tower of Babel is a remarkable incident. We read about it in Genesis chapter 11. Because that's really important, because a lot of people ask, well, how do you explain all the different ethnic groups and cultures and so on? That's right, that's right. And, and this is the origin of different languages. You see. If Adam and Eve, well, they would have had a language, right? And they would have taught their children that language. And their children would have taught their children, who would have taught their children, and so, so on. So we should only have one language. There should language only be one evolved, language. Yeah. That's right. Uh -huh. um, and so the evolutionists would have to say, all the languages that we have on the face of the earth today must have uh, resulted from small variations in each of these, uh, of, of this common language. And it all fanned out into the wide variety of languages that we have today. Um, they also believe, of course, that uh, originally the languages would have begun with um, sort of grunts and uggs and sort of, you know, yes. basic sounds and then become more and more sophisticated and elaborate and so languages should have, uh, have improved and become more and more complex. But remember, science is about observation, observable, repeatable experiments. So let's have a look and see what we see when we examine languages. Well, the first thing we observe is that every language that has ever been observed on any people group around the world has very complex structure, capable of um, communicating abstract concepts and so on. Um, and languages actually degenerate over time. I'll give you a good example. Compare, say, uh, Shakespearean English with uh, text messaging. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> so, you see, we, our language degenerates by reduction in vocabulary and shorthand ways of saying things, we actually get less and less um, sophisticated in our language. So it's a downhill process. What we observe is the opposite to what evolution actually needs. But there's one other remarkable fact, and that is that linguists today have identified something like 15 to 20 basic language groups which are so radically different from each other that one could not have evolved through from random processes from the others. Okay. And, you know, it's fascinating. When we look in the book of Genesis, we discover that Noah had 16 grandsons. Now, the Bible says that God confused the languages of the people at the Tower of Babel, but along family lines. So in his grace and mercy, even though he was judging um, their disobedience at the time, okay. he did not separate husband and wife or parents and children. He kept family units together and it's quite likely that it was Noah's grandsons as the heads of their different clans and families, um, which were the lines upon which those languages were divided. Now, I'm not saying that's absolutely the case, but it's fascinating how close the parallel is, isn't it? To that, yes. In other that's words, the evidence that we see in the world around us is exactly consistent with what God's Word says. Wow, that's amazing. So now you've... you've talked us through all these things and perhaps there might be some people that are watching and they're fairly convinced. What's the next step? What can they do now? Well, I think that in the light of what we see in the world around us, in the light of the fact that the evidence that we see overwhelmingly confirms what the Bible says, that it makes it such a straightforward step of faith to believe that the Bible's message, the gospel message, is in fact true. 
And the gospel message is that even though we were once in perfect relationship with our Creator God, way back at the beginning in the Garden of Eden, that even though Adam and Eve rebelled against God and brought separation between mankind and their Creator, that we can have that, that relationship restored again. The Bible tells us that it's through faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. And the reason that is so is because God sent Jesus. He came in human form, in the person of Jesus. And why did he do that? He did it so that he would take on himself all the consequences of our rebellion, our sin. And that's why Jesus gave his life for us on the cross. So he took the price that we could not pay onto himself. So by faith, we can now come back into relationship with our creator, the creator of the universe. And I think that is the most vital part of all of this. And that's an amazing thing, to be able to have a relationship with the one that made you. And it really speaks so many words, you know, languages, as we've just been talking, you know, about, about the type of God that we have. And I think this is a wonderful thing that once people are able to get past these things, you know, that are hindering them from being able to listen to the message of God, they'll truly be opened up to the, the wondrous things Absolutely. that God has placed in His Word for us. I mean, that's what He has left us with. That's right. Essentially. That's right. Yes. Mm. Mark, thank you once again for your wonderful knowledge that you've shared with us. And uh, also, is there a website? Can people find out a little bit more about yes. these things that you're talking about? Let me encourage folks to go and look at creation.com. There you'll find answers to all these questions of claimed ancestors and the evolution of man and so on. Answers which are God honoring and show that the Bible is in fact the source of truth. Thank you once again. Thank you, Rommel. To our viewers, we pray and hope that you found this episode to be interesting and also challenging. Please don't walk away from this thinking, oh, this is just another load of nonsense, but be challenged by it. I hope you've written some of these things down. Rewatch this episode. Perhaps go and visit the um, website that we've listed and check these things out for yourself. Until then, may the Lord bless you and goodbye.